forty percent of the world's population will be diagnosed with cancer during their life. Fifty percent if you're male. So we can flip a coin, the two of us right here. I realized very quickly that the cure for cancer is early detection. The problem is we can't find cancer early for everyone because there is no way to screen for cancer ever in the body. That's fast, accurate, and affordable. The cancer healthcare system is broken. Every year, 10 million people be diagnosed with cancer late, and screening guidelines only exist for half the types of cancer, making early detection rare. This decreases a patient's five-year survival rate to less than 20%. But what if we could channel the tools of artificial intelligence to make cancer screening faster, more affordable, and more effective? How many lives could we save if cancer treatment went from sick care to preventive care? My guest today is Emmy Gal, a software engineer and founder of Ezra, a full body screening company that uses the power of AI to make MRI scans faster and cheaper. In the US, we have a shortage of radiologists, especially in MRI. Medical imaging is especially primed for AI because there's a lot of data. We need to support these radiologists with tools in order for them to be faster and in order for them to potentially be more consistently accurate. Coming up later, we visit a radiology facility that offers the Ezra full body scans and one of our directors even gives the scan a try. Stick around as we learn why cancer screening is such a challenge, how we can address the problem through artificial intelligence tools and make it more affordable for everyone around the world. The only way to solve our biggest problems is to have the audacity to try. Welcome to In the Arena with Evan Baer. Pretty incredible. Oh yeah. It's the world of AI in healthcare and- it's a big one. Yeah, it's huge. I know a little bit about it. Well, good, because I'm excited to like get into it with you today and- I'm ready. So the article that uh, is sparking today's deep dive is from Let's Talk Software Development. And okay, I've heard of them. Yeah, they do a lot of great stuff. And the article is called AI in Healthcare, <laughs> Transforming the Future of Medicine. <coughs> and it was just published on October 2nd, 2024. So it's pretty recent. Very relevant. Super relevant. And one of the things from the article that really caught my eye right off the bat was this stat that said, by 2030, the AI healthcare market is predicted to like explode from $11 billion to $188 billion. Whoa. Yeah. Oh. I know. Crazy, right? It is wild. So clearly something big is happening here. And yeah, I'm kidding. I want to kind of unpack that and figure out what it means for all of us. So I guess to start with, um, the article, you know, kind of paints this picture of AI playing all these different roles in healthcare. Mm -hmm. It's not just one thing. Yeah, it's everywhere. And there was this anecdote that I thought was really interesting about a healthcare client who was just like drowning in data. Oh yeah, I remember that one. And they were like, we don't even know what to do with all this information. And AI came in and was like, bam, problem solved. It's good at that. Yeah. Apparently. Finding information. I mean. Yeah. And one of the areas where I think AI is really starting to make a difference is in early disease prediction. Huge. The article talked about how AI is being used to improve the accuracy of mammograms. Oh yeah, that's a good one. And I was like, wait, really? Uh -huh. So tell me more about that. How does that even work? Well, essentially they feed like a ton of data into this AI system, like yeah. thousands and thousands of mammogram images. So the AI is learning from all these images. Exactly. And then it can start to recognize patterns. Oh, so it can spot things that maybe a human radiologist would miss. Yeah. Yeah. Or it can flag things that need a closer look. So it's not replacing radiologists, but it's like giving them a superpower. That's a good way to put it. So what kind of impact is this having? Like, are we seeing actual results? Oh, yeah, for sure. Contact centers are becoming the centralized hub of communications in the healthcare system. It's going to play a very important part because voice is not going to go away. So many things could be happening with CX and healthcare and you know the contact center as a service is a large landscape so I'm wondering what other ways you see the CCAS market as we call it contact center as a service improving CX for healthcare moving forward. I've got like a two-part answer for that. Uh, one is conversational AI is always improving. There's interaction analytics that work and have many aspects to it, you know, as far as like the tuning part. You know, it could be analyzing the communication journey to recognize trends, keywords, trends, make it more personalized conversation as time goes on and they get to know Ronnie because maybe she calls in 
you know, uh, more than once and, and get to know her. It could also be to score conversations for keywords and tones like, hey, every time somebody calls about this drug, they're angry. Why is that? You know, and kind of be able to, to be, where are we coming up short? How do we fix that and, and be able to, to take the analytics and, and drive value out of it to be able to correct some of the, uh, make more efficient conversations, if you will. But it also could be dynamic too, right? Like an example of, hey, I want to make an appointment on Thursday to see Dr. Smith. And then the IV says, well, Dr. Smith isn't available for three weeks. Do you want to wait? Well, who is available? I don't want to, you know, I don't want to wait. Who's available on Thursday? Because I need to see somebody, right? So being able to have that dynamic to say, go into the tools and find out who the right skilled professional is that's available at that time and pivot all on dynamically on a call is where we're headed. And it, it won't work in siloed tools because you need it all to work together and have a unified platform to be able to do it, but we're getting there. So that's one. The second thing I would say about CCAS that I'm seeing is that I'm finding that contact centers are becoming the centralized hub of communications in the healthcare system. It's not there yet, but as we streamline the tech stack, reduce the reduce that because it's unsustainable the way it is to have all these point products. Budgets are shrinking, the data needs to be unified. CCAS is going to be that central hub and the reason for that is because it can integrate with the back-end systems like the EHRs, the revenue cycle tools, the CRM tools, customer relation management tools. It can also connect to the outbound, it can connect to the remote teleworkers, the remote workers, it connect to your mobile consumer base, it can patient at home as we move more care to outpatient and patient at home and hospice and post-acute. You can have those connections from a patient journey. And then you're also starting to see it connect to the internal clinical communications, the operator consoles. So you're going to see it. It's the long game, but it's going to play a very important part because voice is not going to go away. Voice will always be there for the reasons I just mentioned. The oh, by the ways. I must, you know, can I, while I have you, can I talk to you about this? Or can I talk to somebody about this? Voice is always going to be a critical component of healthcare. Artificial intelligence in healthcare is a topic that's been gaining a lot of attention lately, and for good reason. The journey of AI in healthcare began decades ago with early diagnostic systems and has since evolved into sophisticated tools that can predict patient outcomes, personalize treatment, and even assist in surgeries. The potential impact of AI on the healthcare industry is immense, promising to enhance efficiency, improve patient care, and reduce costs. On one hand, AI has the potential to revolutionize the way we diagnose and treat diseases, making healthcare more efficient, personalized, and effective. AI-driven diagnostics can quickly analyze medical images to detect conditions like cancer at an early stage. Personalized treatment plans powered by AI can tailor therapies to individual patients based on their unique genetic makeup and medical history. On the other hand, there are significant risks involved, data privacy issues, data security breaches, and biases in AI algorithms are major concerns. Additionally, the lack of transparency in AI decision-making and potential job displacement pose further challenges. When we talk about integrating AI into healthcare, one of the biggest challenges we face is ensuring that these systems are designed with ethics in mind. Ethical considerations include the importance of transparency and accountability in AI systems. It's crucial that AI decisions are explainable and that there is a clear responsibility for outcomes. Another major concern is data privacy. Data breaches in healthcare can expose sensitive patient information, leading to identity theft and financial loss. For example, the 2015 Anthem breach <laughs> compromised the data of nearly 80 million people. Secure data handling practices, such as encryption and regular audits, are essential to protect patient information. And then there's the issue of accountability. When AI systems make errors, determining who is responsible can be challenging. 
Is it the developers, the healthcare providers, or, or the AI itself? This ambiguity complicates the integration of AI in healthcare. As if these challenges weren't enough, there's also the issue of workforce disruption. AI could potentially displace many jobs, necessitating extensive retraining programs for healthcare workers. There's the question of equity. AI has the potential to reduce disparities in healthcare access and outcomes. For instance, telemedicine platforms powered by AI can connect patients in remote areas with specialists in urban centers. Additionally, AI-driven health apps can provide personalized care recommendations to underserved populations, ensuring they receive timely and accurate medical advice. By analyzing large data sets, AI can also identify at-risk groups and help allocate resources more effectively, ultimately promoting a more equitable healthcare system. Despite these challenges, AI is already being used in a variety of ways in healthcare, from predictive analytics to robotic surgeries, AI-powered imaging analysis, and virtual health assistants. One of the most exciting applications is in personalized medicine. AI can help tailor treatments to individual patients based on their genetic profiles. For example, AI can analyze a patient's DNA to predict how they will respond to certain medications, allowing doctors to choose the most effective treatment with fewer side effects. AI is also being used to improve patient outcomes in hospitals. For instance, AI algorithms can predict patient deterioration, allowing for timely interventions. Additionally, AI-driven diagnostic tools have significantly increased the accuracy of disease detection, such as early stage cancer. These advancements are transforming patient care and enhancing recovery rates. And in the field of robotic surgery, AI is enabling doctors to perform complex procedures with greater precision and accuracy. For instance, AI algorithms assist in real-time decision-making, guiding robotic arms to make precise incisions. This not only enhances surgical precision, but also minimizes tissue damage, leading to faster recovery times for patients. Examples include the Da Vinci surgical system, which has revolutionized minimally invasive surgeries. But despite these successes, there are still significant challenges to overcome. One major hurdle is the need for large, high-quality data sets. Additionally, training AI models can be incredibly complex and resource-intensive. As we look to the future of AI in healthcare, there are several emerging trends that are worth keeping an eye on. One significant trend is the potential for AI to revolutionize drug discovery and development making the process faster and more efficient. One of the most promising advancements is the development of explainable AI. This technology allows doctors to understand how AI systems arrive at their decisions, fostering transparency and trust. For example, if an AI recommends a specific treatment, it can provide a detailed rationale, helping doctors and patients feel more confident in the decision-making process. This transparency is crucial in building trust with both healthcare providers and patients. Another trend is the increasing use of blockchain technology to secure patient data and ensure that AI systems are transparent and accountable. Blockchain can enhance data security by creating immutable records of patient interactions. For example, it can track the provenance of medical data, ensuring its integrity. Additionally, Blockchain facilitates interoperability by enabling seamless data sharing across different healthcare systems, making AI-driven insights more reliable and comprehensive. Finally, there's the potential for AI to democratize access to healthcare. AI-powered diagnostic tools can provide accurate results quickly, even in remote areas. Mobile health apps offer personalized health advice and monitoring, making healthcare more accessible. AI-driven wearable devices track vital signs and alert users to potential health issues, ensuring timely intervention. AI in healthcare should never replace human judgment, entirely compromise patient privacy, or be used without proper ethical considerations. It should also never be deployed without rigorous testing and validation to ensure safety and efficacy.
The role of AI should be to assist and augment healthcare professionals, not to replace them. In conclusion, AI in healthcare is a complex and multifaceted field with both tremendous potential benefits and significant risks. From early diagnosis and personalized treatment plans to streamlining administrative tasks, AI has the power to revolutionize healthcare. However, it also poses challenges such as data privacy concerns, ethical dilemmas, and the need for rigorous validation. Therefore, responsible AI development involves come a long way and AI is taking over the conversation. As 11 News anchor Lacey Griffith explains, doctors are using the technology to better understand what's going on inside your body. The Crystal Denard comes in for her annual mammograms just like other women her age. I have a history of having follow-up examinations because one of my breasts is considered dense. So I've been kind of like in the routine of expecting, oh, I have to go in and follow up. Mercy Medical Center breast radiologist Dr. Evelyn May says follow-up exams for women with dense breasts are common. But thanks to artificial intelligence or AI, technology is assisting doctors in a way that maybe they couldn't see before. We read the mammogram the same way that we normally do, but we use AI to help us focus in specific areas of the breast that can potentially harvest breast cancer. According to Mercy, using AI during a mammogram significantly increases the chance to find breast cancer. Take a look at this example. Once the scan is in 3D, Dr. May is scrolling through the layers of the breast, and then you can see here, AI spotlights an area of concern that would warrant further tests. AI, as you know, learns, right? So the idea is that it learns on multiple patients and in the same patient. So when we read the future mammograms of the patient, also AI can combine old imaging and new imaging to determine whether there's something new showing up. And it's particularly helpful in people with dense breast tissue because that's where cancer likes to hide. Ms. Denard says she is amazed at what this technology is capable of. So it gave me relief and stress-free. I didn't have to worry. Um, Dr. Mays eased my concerns. It's just been a wonderful experience here at Mercy. Dr. May says it's a game changer. Doctors can now pinpoint cancers at very early stages when they are more easily treatable and curable. In Baltimore, Lacey Griffith, WBAL TV 11 News. You know, the invention and the development of calculus really, I think as many of you know who have studied physics, you know that it, it absolutely revolutionized physics because that particular mathematical framework, it provided and of course it continues to provide an utterly foundational tool for understanding how physical systems evolve. I mean, anybody who has studied any physics at all knows that it is virtually unfathomable to imagine that our understanding of anything about the laws of motion could have gotten off the ground if Leibniz and Newton had not given us the calculus. Now, in this conversation, we are going to discuss how AI may well be an analogous game changer for biology. I mean, with its unparalleled ability to analyze and interpret vast amounts of data, find hidden patterns and deeply obscured connections, AI offers the potential to revolution our understanding of life at every level, right? From molecular mechanisms to ecosystem dynamics. Now, we have already gotten a taste of AI's impact on biology through several groundbreaking advancements, some of which we will discuss, because machine learning algorithms have revealed patterns in genomic data leading to new discoveries in genetics and personalized medicine. It has accelerated the identification of potential therapeutic compounds by predicting how molecules will interact with biological targets. And of course, as no doubt many of you know, AI has made remarkable progress in the long-standing and profoundly important puzzle of protein folding. Now one can imagine that as AI continues to evolve, it will reshape biological research with profound implications for the future of science and medicine. And 
Our guest for this conversation has been right at the nexus of all of these developments. So I'm so pleased to introduce Daphna Kohler, who is CEO and founder of Incitro, a machine learning driven drug discovery and development company. She was the co-founder, co-CEO, and president of the online education platform Coursera, and is also a MacArthur. What if I told you 20 minutes is all it takes to build in the stock? Fellow, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. So if we just sort of start with, with the big picture, and then we'll get into some details, where do you see AI and biology going? I mean, this analogy, which frankly I think comes from you. Actually, Eric Schmidt, I think. Oh, Eric Schmidt, OK, fantastic. So I knew it was in some conversation <laughs> that was out there in the ether. But this notion of thinking about AI as sort of the, the, the calculus of physics and yeah. taking that analogy to biology, is that a good analogy? No, I think it is an incredibly powerful analogy because I think as you articulated in the introductory comments, we would not have been able to even start to put a framework around physics without that underpinning of mathematics. And in biology, we've struggled because biology is so complicated, so yeah. multifaceted. There's so much going on at different levels of biological scales, interplay between different entities. I mean, it's very, very complex far beyond what certainly the human mind can encompass or our existing mathematical tools. And the beauty of AI is that I think it will actually give us that sound framework that will allow us to make predictions. Because if you think what calculus does to physics, it basically says if you set up the experiment this way, the following things will happen. And it is by and large, to a first cut approximation, a pretty reasonable prediction. We don't have any such predictive ability in biology. What we have are, in most cases, at the best, like a qualitative kind of descriptive narrative about what's kind of happening. But in a new experiment, what is likely to happen in that new experiment, I mean, people just largely toss up their hands. And you just got to do it to find yeah. out. And I think we will be in a position where the AI will, over time, be able to get to better and better predictions about what will happen in biological systems. I think that will be hugely impactful. It's going to be impactful in human health. It's going to be impactful in the environment, in agriculture. I mean, so many aspects of our life depend on the interplay between, you know, between biological systems. Of course, yeah. And so we really need to have that ability to make better predictions. Now, when it comes to calculus and physics, the nice thing is you have this mathematical tool, and when you understand how to use that tool, at one and the same time, you can also see how that tool is working, right? right. There's nothing that's mysterious within the framework of calculus. but. If AI is sort of playing that role for biology, everybody sort of marvels at the fact that we don't really know what's happening in the innards of the AI system, yet the output, of course, may be something deep and profound. Does that mean that our level of understanding may fundamentally have this vagueness to it because we can't see what's happening inside the system? So first, I would question what is the number of people on this earth who can truly understand the mathematical calculus models of advanced physical systems. So I would just start that. Well, I, uh, so so it's, a, it's, a, it's a privileged few. Now, you could ask, um, will that level of understanding be even lower in the context of AI systems of biology? And the answer is probably yes. But you can get glimpses. And people have been working on uh, explainable AI, um, the you know different ways of understanding what's going on, but I, to my mind, that is less important than the ability to trust that what the that the predictions that are being made are in fact likely to be relevant in the problem that we are applying the system to. And so when people talk to me about the way to AI safety being understandable AI, I think that is, you know, not useless, but probably not the most important thing. The most important thing is to actually do the experiment. With your analogy to the number of people, you know, any physicist who's been trained mm -hmm. can see the workings of calculus in the basic laws of motion. But as I understand it, nobody trained in any way, shape or form will be able to gain a narrative 
for the output of an AI system because what's happening in there is just too complex. Maybe for a biology that's not such a bad thing because as you say, it's the output that really is what draws our attention. So I think, you know, traditional mechanics is, is something that is probably on the simplest end of the spectrum, even yeah. in physics, and then you can go up to more sophisticated quantum phenomena, a number of people understand that shrinks dramatically. Um, in biology, I think it'll be the same thing. There mm -hmm. will be pieces of it where you could kind of get a sense of what the AI is doing and how it's making certain predictions. And as you get into the more and more arcane and sophisticated, there will only be first cut approximations that, that give you only a certain slice of what's going right. on. So I'd like to turn to a couple examples, concrete examples, sure. a handful actually in a moment. But first, if you don't mind, just a moment on your own trajectory, right? Because, yeah. you know, you've had a number of interesting yeah. career zigs and zags. So is there a unifying principle that drives you or how would you describe where you've been and where you're going? Well, you know, Steve Jobs said that life can only be interpreted when you look in, at it yeah. in reverse. And so I, um, I can try and look at mine in reverse, at least in terms of where I am. So I um, started my career as an academic. I thought I would retire as an academic. Both my parents were academics. I was, um, I call myself now an OG AI person because I've been working in uh, the space for long before um, it was considered to be a space when I got my PhD in AI in the early 90s. Um, you couldn't, it was just, it, was, it wasn't a respectable discipline. Yeah. You couldn't say you were doing AI. You right. could say you were doing cognitive computing or statistical learning. You couldn't say you were doing AI. And so I came back to Stanford. I was the first um, new AI, I would say, higher into that department. The one who didn't do old style logic based systems, but more of the modern probability machine learning type stuff. Um, and my career journey, if you had to describe the arc, it's um, an increasing focus on wanting to make an actual direct impact in the world. So I was very conceptual when I started, and I moved into more and more applied um, appli uh, sort of use cases, whether it was first, you know, applied machine learning to biology, um, and first of all, to robotics, then to biology yeah. and medicine. Um, and the Coursera was, um, that was a digression. It was not related to my research agenda at all. It was a passion project that I'd always had about using technology to make education better. And when we put out at the end of 2011, these three courses out there um, for anyone in the world to take for free, and we had 100,000 people in each one of those courses, it was like, oh my God, that is more impact that I could have in a month than I could have by right. writing papers and publishing them and hoping someone does something. And so that led to the Coursera journey, and I spent five years there. And if you look at the timeline, the AI revolution began in 2012, just as I left Stanford. And so, <laughs> No and so, correlation though, right? No, I don't think so. <laughs> uh, but I kind of missed the beginning. And so in yeah. 2016, when I'd been in the Coursera for five years, I picked my head up over the trenches and said, oh my goodness, AI is changing the world and I believe that we are on this exponential curve and that was apparent to me in 2016. Um, and, long before, and that's more or less when you went back? And or? that's when I went back to doing AI for biology and healthcare. And the reason I did that is because I said AI is going to transform everything already yeah. is starting to happen, but it's not having much of an impact in life sciences because there's not a lot of people who speak both languages I and see. I do. And so let's look at some of those yeah. impacts and I know there are a number that you find exciting and have been deeply involved with. One that has to do with collecting and generating data at scale, which of course is central to all these AI systems. So can you tell us a bit about that? So first of all, let me come back for a moment to that exponential Please. curve, because yeah. I think it's really important. Exponential curves are these deceptively misleading things, because at the beginning of the exponential curve, it seems Nothing awfully flat. Yeah. It's going to be decades, centuries before anything happens. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, the exponential curve starts to go up. And it's like, oh my god, we're on this exponential curve. But we've been on that for a while. Yeah. And when you look at the primary driver of that exponential curve, it's the availability of large amounts of high quality data that the machine is being trained on. Yeah. In biology, we're, I would say, five to seven years behind where we see the general purpose large language models today because the amount of relevant biological data is relatively limited. Mm. However, one of the things that drew me back to this field is the realization that not only were we were on a tidal wave of innovation on the AI side, we're also on a comparable tidal wave of innovation 
in generating biological data at scale. And that includes things like being able to take a skin cell from you or me and then return it back to stem cell status where it could turn into any cell in our body. And all of a sudden, I can have a Daphne neuron um, and we can edit that cell. Um, we can introduce perturbations that say, well, what can we make a Daphne neuron that's just like my genetics but with a disease-causing mutation? What happens to that um, cell at that point? We can image the cell in with microscopy at super resolution so you can start to see individual proteins, molecules within the cell. All of these are like tools that life scientists and, and bioengineers have put together that allow us to generate unbelievable amounts of single cell biological data that for the first time, if you pair it with AI, because you give it to a person and their eyes like glaze over, you put the two together and all of a sudden we can start to make causal inferences about if you do this to a cell, the following things happen and it leads to disease in the following way because you can read it from the cell and you can start to interrogate it using the AI. And is that, when you say at scale, there are many axes on which yeah. that scale oh, yeah. could happen. So do you imagine this kind of an approach involving a huge population or is it the data that you can extract from even a single neuron at such depth and scale that it gives you an enormous amount of data? Is it both? Or? So the answer is it has to be both, okay. I think, because you can certainly um, have a lot more flexibility in generating cellular data. You can edit it to introduce mutations. You can put drugs on it to see what happens. But ultimately, what you care about when you're making medicines is not curing cells. You have to cure people. Yes. And so to close what is called the translatability gap, which is taking what we can do in the lab and make sure that it applies when you do it to a person, you start to need population scale data yeah. around human biology and human clinical status. So what state is that in? I mean, we have this other um, visual here, which I think is given one a sense of generating cells yeah. in the lab. This is, this is cells in motion. It's one of my favorite things. You could actually see them and look at longitudinal progressions of the cells as they mature, as they are perturbed. And so, you all, so that gives you the starting point of causality because causality is fundamentally what you need to understand in order to make interventions in a person. Yeah. Observational data is so misleading. So many things have gone awry in human health by looking at observation correlations and saying, oh, these two kind of go together. Well, these two go together because, you know, there's some third thing that is completely unrelated that is driving both of them. And so you're not going to get to actual medicines that work. Here, by watching cells in action following perturbations, you can start to get a sense for what happens as a cause effect. And are there any concrete insights today that these approaches have already Resulted? Oh, there's uh, there's many that you, I mean certainly in the in the context of core cell biology we now have a much better understanding and this of course all started with the human genome project yes. so that you could actually have that as the beginning of what do I perturb right. so as to make a difference but we now understand so many biologies including ones that are relevant to um, to human disease in in really exquisite ways for the first time. Now, another great success story, I, I mentioned it at the outset, but I would love to just spend a moment or two diving into it, is the protein folding yeah. problem, which I think is the one that many people have heard of. And if you could just give us a sense, A, why is that a vital problem? Why was it so hard? And how is it that AI has allowed us to make progress where decades of yeah. more traditional work just couldn't make any heads or tails of the situation. So it's this beautiful example of an AI success story. And hats off to the people at um, uh, at DeepMind, DeepMind who, yeah. who who um, who put this in motion. Um, I mean, it's a really hard problem because we have had a very simplistic um, physics-based model of how proteins fold that was driven by our human understanding of, yeah. of the underlying uh, physical system, which is frankly quite coarse-grained, and and sure. um, and so. Those mo models were 
used, and they really plateaued about five years prior to the um, DeepMind. Uh, Forty percent of the world's population will be diagnosed no with cancer in performance for about five years. Um, the reason why this is such a beautiful um, AI success story is because protein folding is one of those few places where, at the time that it was launched, one of the few places where there was sufficient data to actually train the models. Um, the nice thing about proteins is that they, um, there's a lot of them. There are a lot of them across species. They fold in the same way regardless yeah. of whether they're in a yeast or in a bacteria or in a person. And so there was a lot of training data of sequence to structure. And, and they were able to take that and introduce a little bit of sort of intuition from the, from the physics and also from, um, from human evolution about uh, into the model, what we call in, in formal jargon inductive bias that allowed the model to really take advantage in maximal ways because, you know, while it's nice to have hundreds of thousands, it's not hundreds of millions. And so that combination of some, um, some insight about how the process actually works alongside a lot of data was really the winning combination in that particular case. And by doing that, they were able to basically learn an energy function. This biohacker that yourself. Is, um, I give it. Quite different than the energy functions that people had tried to hand construct. And what is also really important is because it is a learned model, it is much more expandable. And so that, has, that is what has driven all of the developments that have happened since of co-folding with another protein, with the ligand, with, you know, really, because once you have a data-driven approach, you just give it the right kind of data, and it just knows how to suck that in and put that into the same framework. Whereas if you'd had to do the same thing with a the person, they, they would have said, oh, wait, that's a whole different problem. I now have to go back and sit and think about how to design the model from scratch. For AI, it, it's very flexible. And so has this had an impact on people's thinking about the role of you know, the more traditional idea of modeling a system as opposed to just using enormous amounts of data to try to extract yeah. patterns? I think it's showed us that it's, that, it, that you benefit tremendously from large amounts of data, but, um, and that pretty you should incredible. be seeking oh, yeah. places in biology where those data exist, because those can really push, um, push us beyond the boundaries in significant ways. But I think it also showed us on the other side that the numbers that we currently have not are, big are not big enough to yeah. do it without any inductive bias whatsoever. Um, and so that combination today, I think, is where the sweet spot is. And what about this other example of RNA sequencing? That's also an arena yeah. where there's been significant yeah. progress. So that's a really exciting, again, bioengineering development where you can take a single cell and basically sequence the RNA in the cell. So everybody now knows about RNA because of the vaccines, but RNA is, is this um, intermediate between DNA, which is kind of like a printout, if you will, of a program. And this is like the beginning of executing that program. And if you can look at the RNA in a single cell, it tells you what the cell is actually doing, which parts of the genome are active, and, um, and, and, and so that starts to tell you which processes the cell is engaging in and also which of those are potentially disrupted by having um, some, you know, some mistake in your genome or some, um, or some cellular exposure that makes the cell sick. And so that ability to collect cell, that, that activity profile of a cell at the single cell level, and you can do it for hundreds of millions of cells in a single experiment. And now you're talking real numbers. Mm. Um, um, and and so and especially because of some of the additional advancements I men mentioned earlier, this notion of CRISPR, which um, some people have heard of as a therapeutic, which is you introduce CRISPR into the body and it starts editing your cells to correct a genetic mistake that makes you sick. But it's actually at least as valuable as a research tool. So there are these things called pooled CRISPR screens where you take these hundreds of millions of cells and each one of them gets a different intervention. Each one of them gets a different change in its genome. So now you have a beautifully controlled experiment, which you would never be able to do in people because we're all so different in so many ways. These are cells that are identical except for one thing. And so you can start to ask, how much of a difference does, does that thing make to the, multiple, to the very complex cascade of events that, um, that happens? And now we can start to get at that causality at the single cell level with enough data that um, to feed the machine learning beast. And, and, and so does this sort of start to build, I don't know what the right word would be, but like a, a chat GPT for cellular systems? per se? I mean, that sort of 
got enough data yeah. that it stands alone, but it's so specialized that it's going to give you the kinds of answers that are relevant in the cellular domain? I think it is, and I, we're really excited about that. I mean, we should understand that this is a journey because even within our human body, there's thousands of different cell types, and to do this experiment, we need to do this again and again across at least multiple cell types to the point that we might be able to extrapolate to ones that we haven't done the experiment in. No one has gotten to that stage yet. But we're at the cusp. Remember I told you that we're five to seven years behind in the yeah. data for biology? This is because we have that capability to start printing data at this massive scale. And I can do this for neurons, and I can do this for liver cells, and for heart cells, and for fat cells, and for muscle cells. And over time, we'll begin to have a notion of, if I do this thing to this type of cell, the following things will get disrupted. And then I can start making predictions about what disease does to a human. And what do you think the time scale is for putting this into full practice? I mean, to deal with some of the most degenerative diseases that we face, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, you know, heart, you know, every part of the body is subject to entropic decay, is the physicist's way Sadly, of describing it. So uh, are we heading in a place where in our lifetime you may put in the right prompt, poetically speaking, and get out some kind of prediction for what we need to do? I think that within our lifetime, we should be able to make much better, I mean, pretty reasonable predictions about what an intervention will do, at least to a reasonable set of cell types. Now, I think it's important, however, to remember, and this is coming up, I know, to a topic we're going to discuss, that this is at the level of a cell. And a yeah. cell is a very reductionist thing. I mean, even a single organ has multiple cells of multiple types. And yeah. so that's where you need to start thinking about it as coming from both sides. You need to build more complex cellular systems, and there is a lot of work going on on multicellular cultures and organoids and things like that so that you can actually start to investigate in a dish what happens when we have a, more, a less reductionist system. And at the same time, to close the translatability gap, you need to understand, okay, fine, but we're not going to have whole humans in a dish. Right. So how are we, what does this do in an actual human so that my predictions from what I see in the dish These are come actually a long way. relevant and to us exactly, as a whole system? Exactly. And, and, and so what, what tools do you imagine using to head at the more aggregate yeah. type of approach. So this is a place where I think we're seeing similarly a growth in the amount of data that is available about human individuals. Things that used to be incredibly expensive and only available to a small in a small number of patients, like MRIs, like uh, you know, for example, as we know now, the new Alzheimer's drug require an MRI to be done before the drug is even prescribed. And so all of a sudden we have this wealth of data of MRIs that is now available to us. And if we start putting it together with other covariates like human genetics or human genomics, so we can start to see the connection between um, things that we could, inter because you can't intervene in an MRI. An MRI is the final readout. Yeah. But I can intervene in a molecule or in a gene. So if we can start to, to, to measure when you have this genetic makeup, this is what happens to your MRI you can start to sort of say, okay, this is the node, this is right. the hub at which an intervention might make you have slower neurodegeneration, say, if you have Alzheimer's. And I think that's really exciting. And, and what, what, what's the profile of the person who sort of works in this space? I mean, mm. we're talking about large data. We're talking about, obviously, computer sciences, you know, AI in terms of blending those two together. But then, you know, biological expertise, one would think, still has a role to play in sure. really trying to understand how to put this all together. So is a new breed of science mind being trained to do this, or you just use the traditional disciplines and we'll just bring them all together? So first of all, let me say that even taking the traditional disciplines and bringing them together is an incredibly hard problem. Yes, of course. Because people are trained in very different ways. They think about the world. They have different jargons, different expertise, and different ways of thinking about the world. So for example, if, you're, if you have a bunch of points on a, in, a, in a graph and you're an engineer, you're looking for the simplest pattern that explains that bunch of points so that you can make good, reliable predictions. If you're 
a scientist, often you look for the outliers because the outliers are like the things that don't make sense and those might be the next new big idea. And so you take, in order to bring those people together and make them communicate is a very complex social engineering problem. Yeah. The people that you just described, the ones who are what I call bilingual, who actually are able to think in both ways and talk both languages, are an invaluable component of that mix because they can play the translator and they can bring those two points of view together um, in ways that if you just take the two disciplines in the room, and even if they're incredibly well-meaning, often there's just this impedance mismatch that makes it hard. And I would say that has been one of my biggest tasks as I build um, in Citro is to, which by the way, is um, for those of you who are aficionados of Latin, it is the merger of in silico, which means in the computer, and in vitro, which means in the lab. And so it actually is part of the ethos of the company. Um, and so bringing that, those groups of individuals together to the point that they work effectively has been incredibly important. And one of the things that we've seen is that when you do that, and they, they really do work together, they not only come up with better solutions, they come up with better problems that neither group would have thought of on their own. And as someone who you know, spent five years in the education mm -hmm. space, do you see the opportunity or the need for remaking education so that we can maximize our human capacity to leverage these tools? I think um, in, the con in, in the world of AI, which is the world that we're now emerging into, um, educating people differently becomes a par of paramount importance. Yeah. Because I think you know, the need to memorize stuff went um, w w the way of the dodo when we had a Google. Um, so we didn't need to memorize stuff. We needed to start putting patterns together. Yeah. That too is something that the AI is now going to be able to do better than we do, where I think we really need to train people to think in a structured way about what are some really big, important, gnarly challenges that we need to deal with, and then break it down into pieces that the AI is able to help, in many cases, solve better than the person. But the structuring of the problem, the, the coming, the envisioning of it, and the breaking it down into pieces, I don't think the AI is there yet. So there is still a place I think for us. If we, um, yes, if we are, I think there is, and I think there should remain such, but we need to make sure we're training our kids to, um, to think in the right way. So if you were to look at the next 10 years, I mean, obviously you're in a setting of a company, and you've also been in the setting of academia, yeah. so maybe even blending those two perspectives. 10 years from now, where would you envision all of this going? I mean, there's a, is there going to be some you know, an encyclopedic database that will be the basis of the AI systems that we use to promote human health, or, or what structure would you implement? You know, I think there is, um, if, I, if I had a magic wand, I would certainly want to create an encyclopedic database that um, allows um, AI algorithms to be trained on biomedical data so that it can achieve its full potential. I think the barriers to that are more societal than they are technological. People are still in the mode of hoarding their data and don't want to share. But I think that the opportunities here are hugely significant. And we oversimplify by giving things labels that are based on very coarse-grained symptomology that is, frankly, not relevant to the underlying biology. Yeah. Alzheimer's is not one disease. Right. Um, diabetes is not one disease. And yet we give one drug to everybody, and then it works for 20% of patients. It's OK, well, that's pretty good. Um, well, I think that, and, and that's why you know drugs cost so much, and and why many people remain sick in even in today's world. So, the ability to really disentangle the, that complexity, that heterogeneity, and find a fit for purpose, high effect size intervention for each subtype, for each um, individual in the long run, has has got to rely on AI and large data. And I think that is the opportunity to transform human health. I think there is an equally large opportunity if you want to sort of look at yeah. the really big picture. I mean, I don't think it's lost on anyone that the problem of our day is, um, is you know, climate change and its effect on both human health but also on the environment as a whole. Um, I don't think we're going to be 
able to address that without the help of, of AI to help us make um, crops that are more sustainable. Um, plants that help suck carbon, carbon capture. Uh, car yeah. com I don't think we're going to be able to do that without um, biological systems tools, and I think that we're not going to be able to build them without AI. So, so one final question, one that I've asked.